Thank you for your introduction, Jakob. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session. Rebecca has a very impressive uh, CV. She's a PhD candidate at the Pennsylvania State University, Department of Learning Performances Systems in the College of Education. She's pursuing a dual degree in learning design and technology and comparative international education programs. Her main research interests include games and learning, video games, learning and representation, learning and teaching in online environments, teaching and learning with technology, massive open online courses, and gender studies. She also adds a cultural lens to her research as she explores the influence of culture on different environments where learning, collaboration, interaction, and teaching um, occurs. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Yolanda, and good afternoon to everybody. So um, today's topic is going to be about, just as you see on the slide, Massive Open Online Courses and how can we contextualize MOOCs in the African context. So just kind of a brief introduction to what I believe MOOCs are and that what we know about MOOCs is that they are massive because they are, you know, open online and then many people can actually get to register in one course open because everybody with an internet connection, a tablet, you know, smartphone. And right now what we know is that like edX, you can just download app on your smartphone and just, you know, follow the courses on there online because it's kind of on the web and then it's a click away. So those are basic things that we know about most. And that's what at the time when they kind of took the whole world in the storm in 2012, everybody was like, you know what? This is going to be disruptive, you know, for education. It's going to disrupt higher education. And everybody was wondering, they were like, are we sure that education that we know, higher education as we know it today, is going to survive because of the, you know, uh, most opportunities. So it was really great. And everybody also thought that this was going to democratize education. So what is happening right now is that most MOOCs are free. And then irrespective of your location, geographic uh, location, e uh, economic status, because they are free age. So they found out that actually uh, studies looking at MOOCs participants, like in the profile or demographics, they found out that people from everywhere in the world and actually just registering the courses. And personally, I've registered to so many of those. So kind of just tailoring my education or whatever it is that I needed to learn to the specific course. So it's really a great, a great place. So that's why we talk about it being highly specialized. Like if I want to learn JavaScript, let's say, I would just go to that specific course. So it's definitely kind of, you know, tailored to the customer, I would say, or the learner's need. And of course, uh, intelligent electronic devices are the only barrier to learning. Why am I putting that to learn, uh, barrier to learning? Just because if you don't have uh, that internet connection, if you don't have a computer or a tablet, then that will be a challenge. And that's why it brings me to us in the context of uh, the African context. So how can we harness uh, the potentials of MOOCs to fit them to uh, the specific needs of the learners on the continent. So one thing I would say is that if we ask ourselves the question, can MOOCs then democratize education in Africa? The, the studies that have been done on MOOCs, and when they talk about them being uh, good, is that most of them have been done in the Western world, right? So, but when we come to the continent, these are the challenges that we find. We find that, uh, infrastructure, like we don't have enough space. Sometimes our populations are definitely extremely young. So and then we have so many of those who are after they get their um, high school diploma, they get to the university. So we don't have enough space to kind of, you know, uh, put them in the classroom. We have a further thing because if you don't have enough money, most of our higher, higher institution back home, most of them are kind of, you have to pay. So if you don't have enough money, then you can go to uh, a higher education institution and actually have even quality education. So shortage of teachers, of course, uh, the, the, the ratio per, per student sometimes is kind of 100 for one student, uh, for one teacher, this time between institutions of learning and learners, because uh, for you to, uh, let's say, 
from where you live to which to the location where you have to take your classes, the distance quite long, and then transportation, all of that is adding to the burden of being trying to get quality education. So, can MOOCs democratize education in Africa? Then my answer would be yes. But there's a problem. Is that MOOC learners demographic? So, as I was saying before, mostly uh, the studies that have been conducted found out that most of the people who are enrolling into MOOCs are actually people who can afford formal education. Like they have means. These are people who are working, and maybe they don't have time to go into the classroom. And most of them are from uh, North America and Europe. Few learners from Africa. So what is it that we need them to do? So here are the challenges for Africa. Uh, access to internet is still limited to a small percentage. So these are the, the, the findings that we are uh, from the World Internet Stats that um, penetration of internet in Africa as of March 2017, we found that only 9.4% of people have access to internet, 90% uh, the rest of the world. So you, you can see that the penetration of internet is really, really, really limited. And these MOOCs are actually based on what? Your web connection, as we said before, and then having an electronic device. So when, when we look at also percentage of women compared to men using internet back uh, in Africa, we found out that 18% of women are using internet and then 24% are, are, are male. So we also see this disparity between a men and a female. So democratizing uh, education in Africa using MOOCs is kind of a little bit challenging. So when we see another challenge of technology penetration, this is kind of a uh, uh, a survey that I got from different sources. So when we see mobile subscription, we see that 81% of you know people on the continent are actually using uh, mobile phones. But again, these are realities that are really unique to, to people who are finding themselves in the urban area. So when you go to villages or rural areas, if you don't have that uh, the network connection, then it's really challenging to find people having the mobile or smartphones. So we see lap laptops and PC, 34%, television, 40%. But one thing that's really popular about Chrome is what is radio. So we have a radio penetration, which is kind of what we call a no technology, but it's something that has penetrated the continent a lot. And even in places where you can't find, don't have access to roads, you still find people who have um, radio. Which brings me to how do we then, using our context, how do we then, using our uh, reality, how do we then harness the benefits of uh, MOOCs? And that's why I, I'm coming into what I call uh, the MOOC, which is massive, massive open on air courses. So, look at, so let us just uh, go a step back and look at our context. African culture is kind of oral in a sense. So uh, that's the primary way that we use to connect or to, to pass down information, to pass down knowledge, to preserve information from generation to generations. Something else too is that the most popular technology that we have is radio. So what are the consequences then? It, it means that we definitely need to explore a cultural, a way that fits, you know, the cultural context to assist in democratizing learning or democratizing education. And that's where the MOOC comes in. Quick definition of what I understand by MOOC is that as a massive open on air course. And what do I mean by that is that we're going to use the technology that we have to reach thousands. And as you saw in the previous slides, the technology that is a no technology, but it has penetrated Africa a lot. And I feel like it's just because it, it harness or it builds on the orality of the continent. It doesn't mean that we don't have um, people, you know, we don't have like kind of a writing type of habit. But the best way, and we are, uh, Africans are, we are well known storytelling and things like that. So I feel like that's why radio has had so much power and has impacted us a lot. 
But so, what does that mean then? It means also that then we have to develop and adapt courses to fit this media if we want to reach thousands, if we want to democratize higher education, but also not only higher education, learning, because what they've noticed here is that with MOOCs, sometimes for some of the courses, because they are so um, customized, sometimes you don't need, let's say if you want to learn Java, you don't need, so some of the students are not some of the learners, uh, some of them don't have a high a diploma degree, high school degree sometimes, because they, they are just looking at specific, what is it that I need? And sometimes you want to uh, go into the job market. So maybe your employer uh, you, or you want to work in a specific sector. So this is what I need to get to that position or to develop in my career. So I take that specific course. So then it brings in the challenge of us thinking about how can we use the technology that we have available on the continent to reach thousands or millions because we cannot take MOOCs as they are provided here in the Western world to just fit into our context. And one thing I've noticed um, on the continent is that most of the time when we have MOOCs, they have to be um, kind of either a university that's kind of getting some funds to uh, maybe launch a MOOC at a specific location, and then people have to come there. So it's not as democratized as you will see it in the Western world, where in your home, in your uh, you know spare time, you can just decide, hey, I'm seeing that course, so I want to you know register into that course. So thinking now, the challenge for us actually thinking about the technology that we have in place to try to contextualize um, MOOCs try to make them reach the same way they reach thousands and millions in, the, in Europe and in North America, trying to reach millions and, uh, in, in Africa. And that's why I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the ratio piece of it. So, oh, uh -huh, I think I went a little bit further. So, what I understand by mock is what thousands could listen at once, which means that if we have radio, and I do remember that um, the good thing about radio on the continent is that not only do we have local radios that sometimes have um, programs in local languages, right? So you, you have people who are talking, and, and that's how usually they will pass down information. I do remember having my um, critical mother who could not speak I mean, she did not know how to use any type of, you could not give her a phone or mobile phone. She didn't know how to use that. But one thing she knew how to do, though, was always to turn the radio <laughs> where uh, she had a specific program that she would listen to. It was in our local language. And she would always turn the radio at that specific time, 4 p.m. She would always turn the radio at a specific time and listen to the program. And then the guy would talk, uh, would tell the stories of, you know, um, how the, the our ethnic group came about, the great kings that we had, and that's how it, and she will use that time also to tell her great grandchildren how, uh, where, how she, when she was young and those things, how she heard about them in the past. So those were ways, not only that she was using, not only to refresh her memory or to keep, but also an opportunity for her to pass down onto us what it is, is it that we, she felt like we needed to know. And it was a great time because people would gather under the tree, but also listen. And many, many people, and, and that's how growing up, and after she passed away, but growing up, and then I would meet other people and was able to connect with them because I had that instruction, but what? And I didn't understand uh, the impact and that it would have later on in my life. So open because it's affordable, the wages are affordable, the only thing that people need to have and that they already have is what is that most of in most villages you find people with a radio, at least one person with a radio. And also on air because you use uh, radio waves, airways to reach many in even in areas where you know you don't have roads, where you don't even have a, mo a mobile service network that are available. And um, also, one thing that also that's going on on the continent is also that you find these mobile services, mobile phones, not a smartphone all the time, but mobile phones that people have uh, in 
areas that are kind of rural or remote areas, you find people with this phone that have radios all, always installed in them. So some of them can actually access a speci um, specific program, specific station. So my whole point here is us as educators, us as online um, designers of, you know, online courses, how do we think about harnessing the specific tools that we have, the technology that we have available on the continent to make sure that we reach thousands and even millions? I feel like the challenge that um, we have as, you know, uh, people interested in education is always that when we see something that's kind of booming here in the Western world, we always want to take it as it is, right? And then just kind of, you know, um, one size fits all take it and dump it in on you know on the continent and trying to to have a, a feel of trying to replicate or mimic you know uh the way it was uh, the program or the technologies run here forgetting that we have specific realities right because everything has to be customized and we do know that learning is actually something that's shaped by the cultures, but also by the context. So when you, you, you're you designing a specific learning material, you always have to think about what is the context, what is the, the, the culture of your learners. And when you think about MOOCs, taking them and applying them or using them the same way they're using here, we are missing a lot of, a lot of uh, we are losing actually, and then we are not reaching the thousands of the millions and we are turning instead of being uh, something that's kind of you know affordable something that's kind of you know opening doors to thousands or millions to get access to it, we are actually in a sense making MOOCs to be some kind of uh, um, tools or instruction that's designed for elites in our society because unless you're a university student unless you are at a specific university that has had the money to kind of create that center or that computer lab for you to have access or to do that then you can afford you can so instead of harnessing the benefits of MOOCs being something that's kind of democratizing education or learning on the continent we are turning it to be again something that's only for people who have no means or can afford it so I feel like and this is my deepest convictions are uh, using the technology and radio that we have. Of course, that will have us think a little bit deeper because there are some things that how do we turn a specific material into uh, uh, what something that can be gone through the radio. So that's a challenge that I think that as uh, designers, as instructors, as people who are really concerned and would love to um, consider that we definitely need to think about it and make uh, it like own it right instead of having something that came to us because it was you know launched here in the western world okay now how do we own it to benefit people on our continent so that's pretty much that what I had to say and I'm now looking forward to your questions thank you Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, thank you for everyone from, from wherever you're joining us from. I notice we are from all over. Um, there is a first question. I'll go straight into the questions. I'll go to Olofun is asking, do we have examples in practice and how much research has gone ahead to validate the um, uh, MOOC? So that's the first uh, is, question. And then the other one. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to combine two and how is this uh, organized? How does it look like? Perhaps you could you could uh, share with that. that. Uh, thank you. Okay, so going back, if I got your first question, where so how much research? Actually, there's no research so far done on that, right? So there's nothing that has been done on that. And why am I even thinking? Because I'm I'm looking at the the chat session here, and I have somebody else asking uh, kind of a similar question. So. Um, not much research has been done on that. This is kind of an idea that's kind of starting, right? So this is, I would say, work in progress in a sense. But when we look at, I remember being a child and having, um, I think it was my grandfather, who was taking uh, lessons from, uh, they, were, they were kind of, you know, those early days of distance education 
where they were mail um, coming from the UK. They will mail you uh, the BBC. I think the BBC was doing that. So they will mail you some classes, some courses, and then you will read those and send them back to them and they will create you something. And that's how some people were kind of, you know, being in Africa but receiving education coming from the um, from the UK or from France, depending on um, the the country or who the colonizer, the former colonizer was. So what? Not much research has been done on that, but I feel like this is an area that needs to be explored. So that leads brings me to a question that Femi just asked. He's like, this is going to, just going to address auditory uh, learners because this is kind of a learning style. One thing I would say is that when we, and I think that's why we're thinking about contextualizing, right? And uh, at the and in using the tools that we have afford, uh, available to us. Because what, uh, what we want to make sure that happens that we want learning. And I think why we are adopting MOOCs back home is because we want to make sure that thousands of millions have access to the, uh, to, you know, the learning materials that they're offering. But again, the obstacle that we're finding or we are running into is what? It's because we don't wish Many just because it's, it's still again um, reserved to a couple of people who can have access to you know university or a university that has developed a MOOC and have the funds for that. So how can we uh, reach thousand? So one way, this is just a suggestion. One way to do that is using the the technologies we have, have available. And I would say that if we think about um, the way information, I think that's why I went into the past. So if we think about the way we've been, you know, taught or uh, how information has been passed down, knowledge has been passed down. So it was school, the storytelling, it was school that auditory mean, that mean that we were actually taught. So that's a great, great way just to kind of, you know, um, look at how do we use what we have to feed or benefit the people on the continent. I don't know if I'm answering the question. Are you with me? Yes. Is that clear now? <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I, I really enjoyed that response. I'm, um, I was actually also thinking about, I mean, in relation to Olafemi's question about auditory mm -hmm. learning, and there were some comments yeah. um, in the chat. Nicola was saying that, um, you know, when you mentioned the idea of, of the documents being sent, you know, the, the kind of um, offline distance yeah. uh, potential, because I was mm -hmm. thinking, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the, using the tools that we have available, so that brings us back to the blend, you know, what, what do we have available and how do we, do we blend it? Because ultimately, you know, you need to communicate the, um, the different media, you know, people should know when that session will happen and then, you know, how interactive is it? Radio is ultimately a kind of a one way, although there's opportunity for, for kind of responses. So I'm I'm just I'm just very interested in the how you know how um, does it actually work and what kind of technologies or or tools do you use uh, in combination with the radio? Oh, that's that's a very interesting question. One thing that I've uh, and one of the comments that I, I uh, kind of you know going through the comments as well. And one of the comments that I had I think was from uh, Renee and thinking about how um, we do remember what they had here in the U.S. with your Sism Street, kind of a television type of way that people were kind of, you know, they were actually teaching kids and teaching kids basic stuff, right? So when we think about blending, I'm not saying that we should go away. No, not at all. Like the MOOCs, the way we have, no, 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 not at all. Absolutely no. What I'm thinking, what I'm saying is that and I, I like the, the idea of Nicola talking about blending, right? So um, we definitely have people like in the urban areas, right, who have the possibility and the means to have access to the internet and all of that. When, uh, when we went back to this slide where we had uh, internet presentation uh, in Africa, it's kind of a general idea. I'm trying to find the slide. 
So we do have, so with that population, we would definitely still use, you know, the, the web-based part of it. But when we think about reaching the thousands, right, thinking about the radio, but also thinking about now that, I'm, uh, uh, now that that question comes up, when I was preparing this presentation, I thought about there's something that's really popular too, is that we have television a lot, right? So uh, um, when do people know that these courses are, passing, uh, are going, going on? We have, of course, radio, yeah? But also we have television that people are watching. And then we, when we look at penetration of uh, television in, in, on the continent, it's, uh, it's the next technology that people have available. If you don't, you are not in urban, urban areas, like we consider everything. So it's kind of just blending everything to make sure that we reach uh, uh, millions or thousands. It's not about giving uh, or um, abandoning uh, uh, the web, the online version of MOOCs, but actually uh, customizing it to make sure that we, because as I was saying before, there is no, there are some causes like if you want to teach people uh, JavaScript, for example, there is no way you can have it, uh, there, there, there will be challenges, right, for you to turn it into uh, um, a radio kind of format because people need to see how to you write those codes. So that might not fit. So that's one thing I'm saying. The blending part, I love the idea, the blending part, not that we are abandoning the, the, um, the web or the online version of, you know, characteristics or moves, but on the contrary, but taking that, but also knowing that there are some courses that will work, or if we want to reach a specific population, then there are some courses that will work best on a radio format. Do, did I answer the question? Yes, that was very clear, absolutely. I think it's quite exciting. Um, to think about learning design ultimately, you know, understanding the problem, approaching the problem uh, from the learner perspective, and then mm -hmm. making best use of, of what we have available. So, so every unique problem is, is considered um, specifically in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm reading something, if you don't mind me asking, actually, um, and I would agree because uh, um, Femi was saying, uh, uh, no, Opeyemi was saying that, you know, and it's, uh, it's definitely a myth, and I would agree with uh, Nicola, that it's definitely a myth that thinking that, you know, this young generation is kind of digital natives and learning style is also me because you you will be amazed to see that some, some of this learn of oh, digital generation that we think that they're actually, you know, more comfortable with technology is not always true. And some of them actually find it very challenging to use this, these tools. And we often assume that, you know what, because they're the digital age, the Android case, so they know how to use all this. No, not, 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 not all the time. So I would definitely go with customizing to the learner's needs is definitely important. And I know for us on the continent, it's definitely challenging. So it's just asking us to think, uh, uh, you know, critically, but also uh, think uh, culturally, uh, conceptualize whatever we have, and I think this is true for every uh, thing that we are doing. Yeah, I would agree with you, Yolanda, this brings us back to the empathy for our learners, absolutely, so because we, we, we want to make sure that we, and when, when we think about technology use, uh, uh, I was reading some reports there, and they were saying that when it comes to radio, that's where we don't find that kind of differences between men, and remember when it comes to, let's say, uh, um, internet use, they will say that, okay, you know what? women sometimes don't feel comfortable using, like, they use it less. And sometimes there's this kind of, you know, they saying that there's this kind of understanding that, you know what, this is just for men and this is not for women and things like that. But when it comes to religion, because religion has been there for so long, <laughs> it seems as if, you know, women are more like, no, there's no disparity, there's no, you know, um, well, well, discrimination in the, in, in the way people are, are, are using it. So... I think it's extremely, extremely important. I don't know whether Irene wanted to come in. I saw a very interesting reference to 
uh, to that um, Made in Germany. Um, uh -huh. And there were some, because people have, have memories of, um, you know, the impact of radio and TV is, is, is so, it's so um, strong uh, that, that people uh -huh, have got yeah. memories uh, for, for a long time. So um, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot, your, your conversation is, is, is prompting a lot of kind of, I think, interesting ideas in, in the chat at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm reading that, and this is really amazing because... Uh, um, it's definitely, definitely another skill set, absolutely. And I feel like that's where the challenge for all the designers of instruction is because, you know, everybody wants to go the easy route, right? MOOCs are already there, so we don't want to think, you don't want to be challenged to, but then it's going to force us to design, uh, uh, let's say to develop at other skill sets. Which are actually already there because we just have, we are not in the sense we're inventing the wheel, but we definitely need to um, get our minds, like, you know, change our, our mindset in the sense. And it's definitely going to be challenging, absolutely. I, I, I do agree with that. It would take some time, but again, it would definitely uh, be challenging, absolutely. Rebecca, I have one more question before I think Irene will also step in, but uh, there was an um, issue in the chat uh, uh, that refers to whether the sessions on radio would be live or whether they would be recorded or would be live and recorded and available later. And also Nicola asking what kind of interaction, would people actually phone in, would there be a conversation? It's just interesting this kind of a synchronicity and this asynchronous, synchronous and what kind of engagement uh, would typically happen? Oh, that. That that's that's a great question, and actually, when I think that I'm, I'm going back to the, uh, the the MOOCs now, when I think about MOOCs, the way they design, so you use some of them are kind of um, asynchronous in a sense, like you 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 know you have your lessons there, you have the videos that you have to watch, and then after what, then you have a week to respond to questions, you know, send them in. So when I'm thinking about the radio part of it, one way. Of course, it would depend on the specific country, right? We, we don't want to have like a, a, a can type of lecture, but one way people can think about it is that uh, then you listen, right? You record the session, then you send it out to people, and then they have like, let's say, one week to respond to questions or whatever you have for your specific population or your specific group. But also, one other thing that works also well is that, and that's a part that I love, that that synchronous part of it, which is um, having people have some kind of, maybe it's kind of an hour where you have um, people calling in with questions. And, and that, I feel like some we can do that in a sense of, let's say, if we have, you've had an, a recorded session where people have, and then you, you've given them some kind of assignment, right? And then after that, then you have a live session let's say for an hour, where people are calling in because now you, you kind of, that's the time with the instructor where people are calling in to um, have answers to the questions or you giving them answers to the questions, kind of clarify places where people did not uh, get it right or you feel like, you know, there was a, um, a, a misunderstanding or misunderstanding of the concept. I think that would be absolutely great. So combining having the synchronous, but also the asynchronous, we we go uh, we definitely go a long way to help. So think about it that way will absolutely be uh, awesome. I think. All right, I think that's that's very uh, that's very interesting, Rebecca. Um, I, I can already see the kind of weaving of the different uh, media happening. And mm -hmm. um, if you just mm -hmm. check. In the chat, there was some sharing of interesting resources, which which I believe uh, Jakob will also share or even add to share. the to, yeah to the website. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, yeah, I, I know you're also keeping an eye on on the chat because it's going. Yeah, I'm also keeping an eye. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Irene was just saying she she lost connection for a while, so she'll she'll butt in, uh, you know, when when she's able to uh, a little bit later. Uh -huh. Um, but uh, but I, I really love the way that um, you know this um, a medium is 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 really considering the learner and and making use of of a technology that's freely available and and like you say that 
that democratizes in the sense that it, it doesn't exclude um, that many people. You know, it's, it's, it's really about giving the maximum number of people access to what they already have um, available yeah. to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, it's definitely um, so important, I think. And that's kind of a, a way I'm kind of thinking about whatever I'm doing right now, always think about the context. Why right? You know, we, we know all of this. We learn it. We, we know that you have to think about the learner. But when it comes to things like that, sometimes, you know, we forget and we kind of say, you know, most are already working, so let's use them here because it's going to be in there. We, we forget about the learner, we forget about the context, so I always feel like it's always important for us to remember that we have a specific context, we have a specific uh, culture, we have learners with different needs, learners with uh, different means. So how do we make sure that the same effect that we found in North America, the same thing that we have found in Europe, like the, con- the whole concept of the MOOC designers were just to make high quality education available and available to many and then how do we do that how do we keep that concept but adapt it uh, on the continent how do we keep that concept and then have it in our own customize it to meet the needs of our context so and i think that's why it's really important to use whatever we have available to make sure that we reach our we reach farthings yeah I see Irene is asking how long are these courses typically and um, in which areas have they been piloted? I think people are curious to to learn uh, about specific oh. examples. I don't know. We, we uh, have uh, it's so interesting. As I was saying before, it's kind of work in, in progress, right? So nothing yet has been piloted. And I would love, because you, uh, you guys are in the fair, I would love to see you, uh, somebody pilot that. So it's definitely, I have not been piloted yet. Nothing has been done yet. It's kind of just, you know, um, because of the challenges that we're facing on the continent. So uh, how do we make sure? So this is how, you know, like when you want to do something, right? And then it happens that, okay, you wanted to reach, have many people and go into the cause, have it, and then we, you realize that, oh my goodness, no, it's just it's still again, a small, a small few, a small percentage of people who have access to such a sort of information, and then you say, how do I make this happen? How do I make sure that many people have access to it? And then you're like, oh my goodness, this is a technology we have. But yet it has not been implemented yet. So I would love, I would definitely love to see uh, uh, that implemented somewhere. That's definitely something I would love to see, absolutely. That's a wonderful invitation, Rebecca. I think um, I think that that gives us um, an interesting, uh, you know, food for thought to see how we could yeah. get involved in in, um, in doing that research. Uh, I see yeah. interesting uh, Nicola saying that not I mean even radio is is not totally democratic because there may be better or worse access or, or kind of sound waves or um, you know uh, in different places. Uh, so yeah. Uh, it just, interesting to see if you have a particular course um, could there be different versions of it depending on on what access you have available so so there's um, you know in that respect the learner would have uh, control over what kind of medium um, would be um, you know um, useful or, or accessible absolutely and, and it, com- it comes back to the idea of blending right so we we, we just uh, we just want to make sure that we, we use what is it that the people, because we, even the wages actually, some wages will not go, like they, they are not going nationwide. And even when they are going nationwide, there are some areas where you can't just have access to it, right? But then in those areas, there are some kind of local regions sometimes. So we definitely want to, just want to make sure that that's where the whole idea of blending is coming up. So making sure that we use what is it that we have available when we want to reach a specific population, what is it that we have available? And when I'm thinking about our courses, you know, we um, we have a, a great need um, on the continent of um, spreading health information, right? Health-related information, because so many people are um, either dying or suffering for things that they don't really, it's not because they, 
things that could be avoided, but because they don't have that information, and then and then we have so many health issues. I'm just thinking about the cost that can be right. So if we have such a MOOC, and then there are so many like hygiene, and I remember at the time when Ebola was kind of you know just killing so many people because. People did not have basic information, right? How do you make sure that, let's say, you wash your hands and whatever you're using, like, make sure that everything is clean. So, if we had, let's say, something on Ebola, I, I, I here at my university, they actually did a course on Ebola, a MOOC, on, you know, when Ebola was, the outbreak, they were kind of, you know, it was a science course, but then they introduced Ebola. But that information was only designed to people who were actually uh, having in, uh, access to the internet. So people who were in remote villages did not have access to that information because who has internet over there? So those are, when you think about the causes, when you think about things that can actually be developed for um, the radio airways, I'm thinking about health information and things that is definitely uh, important. These are things that we are kind of, you know, uh, challenge we are challenged uh, um, is a, there's a lack of information and there's a great need to inform people on how you know to take care of themselves and how to address you know uh, some of the disease that they could be avoided because you know um, if they had that information available to them. So those are kind of, when I'm thinking about cost now, I'm thinking, okay, wow, this is, should be great. So definitely combining is all about blending. Absolutely. It's all about blending. So radio just came like, you know, there's something we can reach millions or thousands with this. So yeah, it's all about blending. Mm -hmm. I, I find that very interesting. I also see... Uh, the I, I don't think, I don't think that we'll always find like... Uh -huh. Sorry. Carry on, Rebecca. Uh -huh. Oh, I want to say, go, go ahead, Yolanda, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I see Nicola saying that internet podcasts are really huge. Um, I mean, there's so many radio stations and so many sessions get recorded. So, you know, content that gets generated in one yeah. place can easily be distributed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yep. yes, I think yeah. this is a lot of material, but do you establish the, the real needs of a community? I mean, do you, would, you, would you do a survey? Would you go and, 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 and interview people? Because how do you understand um, the learner? You need somebody from that community. Because we so easily make assumptions yeah. about our learners. Mm -hmm. Yes, mobile is big in Africa. Yeah, mobile mm -hmm. is fine. Or we assume everybody's got a smartphone. Yeah. So, um, how, how would you? Yeah, but, um, you know, to, to understand the real, real, because people would could be shy about, you know, what they have um, or not, um, you know, and, and how do you get the real information to design to? That's an excellent question, and, and I would I would think that the same way we go, uh, we come up with, let's say. How am I going to put it now? So let's say the same way we come up with the idea of, you know, um, when we develop, when we dev when we think about a specific tool, right, or when we think about a specific uh, um, community. So usually what people do, it depends, of course. So, but usually what people do is that they would uh, have a survey and then they go into the, the area and say, hey, you know what, we, we think about, you know, um, we want to know what is it that people need here. So they kind of do some kind of a survey. Um, I'm thinking about the word now that we needs assessment. That's kind of a technical word, right? So they, they think about, okay, needs assessment. So which type of training are we going to design? So I feel like the same way you would do for a specific research project, that's the same way uh, you would go about it. So think about, okay, uh, des either designing a survey. I, I don't want to kind of say there's a unique way of doing that. And I was just reading in the chat there where Nicola was saying that actually uh, radios are kind of popular in um, South Africa. And this would definitely depend, of course, again, on the specific country, uh, what is that they have available. But definitely going by service and, and again, in some countries, people will sometimes maybe shy away from you uh, 
coming up with a survey asking them they will find you maybe suspicious say hey why are you asking me questions so it depends again on the specific country so we always have to think about it like in my specific country in my specific context if i go with uh, a survey will people be willing to respond or if i go just to sit and then you know see the the, the 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 chief or the king of a specific village and have him maybe bring together have him actually ask questions to his population and give me the information so it depends definitely on the specific uh context or a country because i know in some countries because of maybe the political issues if you come with a, a survey asking people to feel questions, people are they are already suspicious so they will not be willing to answer to your questions but if you go the other route uh going to the king or the committee the, the committee of leaders and say hey talking to them and then now having them relay your information or your questions to the the population mm -hmm. then you will get better results so definitely depends on uh, the context of the community where on the country where you find yourself thank you very much for that response it's, it's really really fascinating um, I see Nicola saying um, that uh, you know again linked to assumptions um, we, we often uh, think what what people need and that may not be what what they need um, would, mm -hmm. would you do I mean you could also do a, a small pilot and just test ideas and I mean that links to Nicola's idea of, of baby steps and micro learning so you can you know start small you don't have to implement this huge thing and then find that that you um, you got it all wrong so uh, kind of an incremental mm -hmm. um, implementation might may also be an idea I don't know how what you think about uh, that idea I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Definitely, the, those micro steps, whatever they call like a kind of a, usually they talk in design. They talk about prototypes, right? So you have a prototype and then you run it and then you see uh, what are the results and what are the challenges and you get it back and then again you say, hey, maybe you, then the larger scale, absolutely. So small steps and that's actually I would I would say that's the best way to go. Small steps small community and and i i'm going back to your question of how do you create a community and i think the best way will be starting with those small like a small group small you know um community and then trying it there and that's how you definitely create those learning communities because then people because they are a small scale then people get to not only know each other but actually know um what is it that the other people are thinking? What is it that other people are, are learning in a sense? So definitely, I will absolutely agree with that. I think it's a great idea, those micro-learning. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps yeah. just one, one last comment, because we, we, we are fast uh, nearing the two o'clock, well, at least on my side, um, um, yeah. time, uh, is that, um, I mean, last week at, a, at one of these sessions, we had uh, the University of Joss, uh, a group um, actually gathering in an internet cafe and they shared, um, you know, that there was a face-to-face -face blend with the technology. So I'm just thinking of your mm -hmm. idea of, of, of access in some regions and perhaps then you could have, get people to actually go out and, and share with others to, to, to bring the idea of storytelling in also. So I, I mean, I think um, there's really interesting possibilities that, that you are, are um, opening up in, in this conversation. Yeah, I think it's extremely. I think it's extremely great. And one thing um, we always and I, I keep uh, saying that to myself and saying, "Hey, always remember the learners that you have, the context that you have, and what is it that you have already available." Because people are used to a specific medium, and then before even you get them to that point where you are like, of course, we're hoping that you know um, uh, the all of the reports are saying that maybe in 2050 something like that around there then the content of internet penetration will be higher and greater than as the economies are booming so hopefully we will get to that point but till then then we have to use everything that we have available right so uh in urban areas okay we have some people with smartphones we have and i was so shocked um then i discovered that when when they're even talking about subscribers, right? So sometimes you find out that the people who are subscribing, most of the time, people less in countries like Nigeria, you will find people like 
the same person has at least three or four mobile phones in urban areas, of course. So, and then when we're counting subscribers, you find out, okay, you know, that person is MTN, that person is the other provider. So, but these are facilities that people who are only in the urban areas and, and people who have means, and people are still using those for not smartphones, but those old phones, because those ones, and when you ask them questions, I'm like, why do we still use those? This like, no, I have a smartphone, but I also have this phone because with that phone, you know what? Nobody can steal it. But when you have a smartphone, then you, you become a target of, you know, theft because people, everybody wants to get own a smartphone. So these are kind of, um, when you think about the context and the realities, these are things that we always have to take into consideration whenever we're designing or doing anything. That's, and I always have to remind myself of that, yeah, saying, hey, you're a designer, but again, always think about, you know, what are your learners and what are the needs and, you know, what is the specific context and how can they benefit from, you know, whatever you're trying to, to share with them, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's so interesting. Um, just to, to uh, my final comment before I hand over to Irene, I see Nicola saying in the chat that let's continue this conversation on Facebook for those of you that are interested. Um, and have got easy access. And then also, Nicolas introduced a very interesting tool, uh, which is called Flipgrid, um, where you take a short little video with your web webcam just to give feedback on your experience. So um, uh -huh. that is really, really fun. Um, I, uh, I, I must all do it. I'll, I'll perhaps do it later today. Uh, so, okay. so we can do that on the events page, and then we actually can see uh, because we're not using webcam now, at least we can see, um, you know, um, the others um, just reflecting on, on the session. So I'm, I'm yeah. going to hand over, unless there's a very, something important that we forgot to mention or say, I think let me hand over to Irene um, to do the wrap up. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks from my side. Thank you. Oh, wow. Um, time flies when you're having fun. That was great. Um, um, I wish to thank Rebecca who woke up early um, because she's, uh, she tuned in from the United States. So she said when we started it was 6 in the morning, so that was really early. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful webinar. Uh, thank thank you. you for everyone who joined from all over Africa and the different uh, parts uh, of, of the world. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, for those who came a little later, we appreciate that you, you actually uh, came in, uh, but we are going to have a recording and the discussion will be continued uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, there is a, um, a link that has been shared um, and the recording will be on YouTube. This was actually happening live on YouTube and Facebook as well. So we, we have all um, kind of media that we use. Uh, thank you everybody for, for being here and we appreciate you. We hope you'll continue. We'll have the next um, 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 webinar that is coming up. We shall be announcing it and um, um, thank you from my side and thank you Yolanda for uh, uh, being there when I was kicked out by technology. I was just actually <laughs> thinking if this was radio it would have been good for me because I'd have been using probably some renewable batteries or something. So uh, over to you, <laughs> over to you, Jacob, uh, for the final words. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.